every time you put together one of those risk matrices, matrices, is that how you say that? Risk, risk matrices. Every time you put together one of those risk matrices, you know what you're doing? You're gambling. You're gambling on the lives and limbs of the workers who work for you. <laughs> It's 12 o'clock. That's high noon, so let's say it. Hi. Hey, it's Todd Conklin. This is a pre-accident podcast. Today, let's chat a little bit about mm, what I think is some of the more interesting operational thinking that's happening in the world around us. It's not the theoretical thinking, the academic thinking, which also I think is incredibly interesting and totally worth our time. This is the more applied side, the operational thinking. This is where we take the safety differently ideas, the the new view safety stuff, the hop stuff that we talk about all the time, and actually put it into practice and apply it. That, my friends, seems like that would be a super interesting podcast to be a part of, don't you think? And by the way, you are. And thanks for tuning in. Thanks for downloading. I can't even tell you how psyched I am that you're listening. Um, it's, it's, it's just, I don't even, the words escape. It's stunning to me that this goofy podcast that kind of started as a little joke has gotten as much attention and support from the community as it gets. It's just amazing. And I know this sounds kind of patronizing and stupid, but I mean, a lot of it is the fact that you guys just keep listening and keep feeding back and keep giving critiques and, and ideas and and topics and things that we ought to listen to. Because if I just make crap up, you know what I'm going to talk about. It's either going to be food or airlines or airports or food or food or barbecue, which is still food, but it's kind of a finite special purpose of all food stuff. And I don't think that would be a bad podcast, um, but uh, I'm not sure that's our goal for this podcast. Although we really should. Yeah, I started watching this show, Grill Masters, and this is a this is a horror. This is somebody who spends too much time uh, in in um, hotels is what this is a story of. And so I'm watching Grill Masters, and that show. I don't know if you watch it, but it just sucked me in. It's like I don't even know what, what it's it's. It's so interesting to me. They they have these teams of barbecue professionals, and they really are kind of professional barbecue contest people. And they give them a surprise meat to qualify, and they have to cook it in kind of a short time. And it's usually something funky. I mean, not funky. It looks amazing, like like I don't know, bacon and sow belly and oh that is bacon i mean oh, sorry a little bacon fixated all those things and then they whittled it down a couple of people qualify and then they have this big contest where they have to make three kinds of i gotta tell you um maybe it's because a show about barbecue which totally is going to suck me in or maybe because it's competitive that makes tv more interesting or maybe because it's just fun to see how creative people are that show is completely worthwhile i don't care who wins i mean it's It's really not important that they win or lose. What's important is they're making barbecue for me to watch, and it has no potential to have any kind of caloric or cholesterolic impact on me. It's uh, it's food pornography. I'll just say it. It's the worst kind of food pornography. It's barbecue pornography. But it got me. I'm hooked. I mean, I haven't watched it since I had my little binge watching on a Sunday, but... um, I'm afraid if the TV came on, two things would happen. I'd binge watch it. And secondly, is I would tell everyone around me all the stuff I learned from the last six shows I watched, which really makes me kind of the perfect expert. I'm not in the industry. I'm not from the same place. And I kind of learned the vocabulary enough to talk about it. Enough about Grill Masters. I mean, that's, that's an important part about Grill Masters. But that's really not why we're here today. The podcast today, it's a summer podcast, and these summer podcasts are always kind of fun, is by special request. And it really has to do today with the notion of of 
the three types of reliability that you manage in any system. You manage the prevention reliability. These are things that predict and prevent failure so you can identify and mitigate all the conditions that exist so that you're actually stopping failure from happening by fixing the organization's conditions, whether active or latent conditions, so that they can't fail. So a great example of that would be guards around uh, a rotating piece of equipment or rubber baby buggy bumpers on a fork truck. That, that's really good prevention resilience. The second type you have is called work resilience. And what that really is, is the practice of doing work, not the practice. That sounds really clinical. I would actually suggest a better phrase would be the art of doing work. The workers exercise caution, care, detection, and risk management, risk competency while they're doing the job. And that's reflected in things like experience, qualification, training, selection, that whole second layer of reliability that you manage, the work execution, it's vital. But it's different than prevention. It's much more adaptive, and it's really allowing workers to understand and recognize when they're drifting away from safety and towards irrecoverability. And then there's the third type of resilience you manage. And that third type of resilience, well, for today... Let's call that safety control. Nope, nope, let me take that back. Let's call the third type risk control. So you have prevention, right, or risk management. You have work execution. That's actually interface with risk. And then the third one is risk control. Now, that's going to be important to us because that's really what we're going to focus on in this podcast. This podcast is going to talk about the notion of controls, essential controls, controls that allow us to do our work. So sit back and relax. I think you're going to find this discussion interesting. If nothing else, it's interesting. And in best case scenario, this little discussion may change the way you manage high-risk operations in your organization. So without any further ado, and again, thanks for listening. Here we go, you guys. This is the Pre-Accident Podcast on Essential Controls. So what would you say if I told you there's really three reasons people die? I mean, there's probably infinite ways you can get killed. But there's three reasons when you look at events, there's three very distinct reasons people can die. And almost none of them have anything to do with with uh, risk management and prevention. People die because the necessary controls to separate the energy from the worker were insufficient. That's one way. Were not present. That's two ways. Or thirdly, the event was beyond imagination. It was beyond the safety basis. Now, that's pretty oversimplified for our discussion. I mean, we could spend probably, I don't know, 35 hours talking about this, but those three ways to die actually help us a lot. Because if you look up, um, you can look up OSHA's, what I think they call them the fatal four, falls, uh, struck bys, pinch betweens, and electrocution. Those are the four kind of top ways, at least in the United States, people die. Top is the wrong word. Those are the four most common fatalities based upon the OSHA data that they collect really across the United States. All of that's pretty interesting and probably valuable. But one of the things we deal with is that there's been a really strong belief that we can prevent accidents before they happen. And to be honest with you, we're pretty good at preventing accidents if we know the accident potentially could happen. So if we've had a good near miss or if we've identified some hazards or some drift, we can intervene if we have early detection and we could absolutely make the system much, much more tolerant of the potential failure that will happen, and we can prevent an accident. The problem with that notion that all accidents are preventable, though, isn't around the word preventability. It's around the word, word – that was a Freudian slip. It's around the word predictability. So you look at mm, some of the early work around high reliability, and they would talk about 
low probability, high consequence events and high probability, low consequence events. And that's an okay way to look at it. I guess what we're going to talk today about is this idea of high probability, no, sorry, high consequence, low probability events. Uh, the reason I kind of got confused there is because I was thinking ahead. Um, Nassim Taleb in his book calls them the black swan events. But for us, let's just call them catastrophic failure. And the problem is, is that we just have a booger of a time predicting where failure is going to happen next. Our systems are big. They're usually incredibly cumbersome. They're almost always complex. They're tightly coupled, and they sort of count on each other. And because that complexity is present, it's impossible for any of us, certainly any one of us, but any of us organizationally, to understand and predict all the places the system could fail. So if we're bad at prediction, then we're by definition going to suck at prevention. And so this idea that all accidents are preventable, it's attractive, but it's kind of set us up in a position where what I think we do is we favor prevention over control. And near as I can tell, when I started this discussion after the little bumper, the acoustic guitar bumper in the podcast, I said there's three ways people die. Either a complete absence of controls, insufficiency of controls, or the event was beyond prediction. It was beyond imagination. And if that's the case, then I think we have to change the way we look at managing risk. Because right now, when we put together a risk matrices, and remember I said you're gambling, what you're really doing on that risk matrix is managing resource. You're managing how much time, energy, emotion, attention, and effort you're going to put into any one part of your operation. And of course, you're going to look at it and say, this is low risk, this is medium risk, or this is high risk. The unintended consequence is we sort of build systems where it's better, quicker, faster, cheaper, and easier to always cheat risk down on the matrix. You don't get a special place in heaven by making everything red. In fact, if you make everything red, you don't get any weekends anymore and you have to work all the time. So you want to make as much stuff as you can green. And I'm not really questioning your ethics. I don't mean this as a moral discussion. I'm just going to tell you incentives being what incentives are. If you give me the opportunity to manage risk down and it, the reward is I get less work for it, I will probably work diligently to manage risk down and even might be working subconsciously to manage risk down, to sort of keep that risk picture manageable as it relates to the amount of time and energy I have to do the work. That, my friends, sets up the case for the discussion we want to have about controls. And to have that control discussion, one of the first things we have to do is introduce a new question. So what is this new question? Well, first, this isn't a moral erosion of the ethical standards you have for your organization. But I want to move you from managing probability to managing uncertainty. And the way I'm going to move you from managing probability to managing uncertainty is really elegant and super easy. I'm going to have you change one word. Normally, we would look at an event and we'd, we'd say, if this fails, and then we would measure risk and green light it, yellow light it, or red light it. The word I want you to change is if. I want you to move from asking if this fails to asking the much richer, much more certain question, which is when this fails. And really what we're doing is we're introducing into the equation of risk management and work execution reliability, we're introducing controls into the system. So the question would sound something like this. Uh, I'm me, you're you, so we understand our roles. You're going to be an electrician. And I'm going to ask you, hey, when you're doing this job, what's the riskiest thing you do? What can kill you? And you're going to tell me, I get shocked and die. 
And I'll say, okay, when it happens, because we don't have perfect systems, we don't have perfect people, we don't have perfect SOPs, not perfect procedures, not perfect conditions, not perfect weather. When it happens, what actually keeps you from dying? And you'll look at me and say, um, I have dialectically safe boots. I have arc flash on. I've got a robust lock and tag out program. It's been independently verified by a second electrician. I have appropriate distance. I have testing protocols. I have tested. Maybe I have a wearable that will tell me if I'm breaking the book. I understand the rules. I'm highly trained. I'm highly experienced. Those things they talk about when you ask them when it fails, what keeps you safe, those things, my friend, are not prevention tools because we didn't ask them what prevents it from happening. We said when it happens, what keeps you from dying, those things are controls. They're on the other side of the equation, and these are the things that actually help isolate the energy, and let's assume the energy is there, away from where the worker is. Those controls are going to be really important to our discussion because ultimately once you identify those cruel, those controls, the next thing you do is ask this question, are they enough? Is that enough? And you're going to look at me because you're the worker, you're an electrician, and you're going to say, yeah, if I, if I do all the things I'm supposed to do, and if in fact the system is pretty resilient and robust, I can manage a variable condition. I can manage a surprise because I've put a lot of emphasis into making sure the controls are in place. Now, what's crazy about that is that takes the notion of hierarchy of control, which lots of us have had hammered into our head and truly believe. You know, the hierarchy of control, if you don't know it, it starts with remove the hazard then it moves down through engineering and mitigation and procedures and process. Usually the last one is PPE, and we say this hierarchy of controls is really valuable. You never want to count on the lower-level controls. You want to actually solve for the hazard the highest level you can on the hierarchy. And that's really okay. It's very linear it's kind of a normative way to look at risk management. The problem with it is it really also implies a value judgment on the edification, the, the, the quality and quantity of controls. And so one way to shift thinking away from that hierarchy but still understand that you manage controls in layers like that is to think about the notion of hard controls and soft controls. So hard controls are actual changes. Soft controls are changes in the way we think of or respond to or react with or adapt to or improvise on the work we're going to do. And let's assume that the hierarchy gives them value judgments. Let's dump that and say every control, if it isolates energy, is in fact effective in being a control. Now, when you do that, all of a sudden, things that we traditionally thought of as controls really become prevention strategies. The best example is stop work. So I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but stop work is not a control. In fact, stop work at best is a prevention strategy. It's not a control because what it says is you psychically predict where it's going to fail right before it fails, and your solution for it is to not do the thing that's about to kill you. And that's a great plan. The problem is most workers aren't psychic. And if they were psychic, they would be working in, I'm thinking, a carnival, state fair, which is like a carnival on steroids. Maybe they'd be in television. I mean, there's, there's lots of places for psychic to work other than your plant. Where this takes us, really, is in changing the way we approach the way our organization recovers. And so that question, what will kill you, when it happens, what keeps you safe, and is that enough, that actually builds a case for managing controls. And the phrase I want you to think about is this phrase, start when safe. Never start and always stop if the fundamental controls that isolate the energy from me when the failure happens are not in place. And what's really nice about that 
is those are actually really easy to measure. They're easy to identify. They're easy to audit. And when you send leaders into the field to look at, at controls, they've got an entirely new thing to look at and an entirely new conversation to have with their workers. Essential controls are the things that actually put a worker in a position where when the failure happens, the failure happens safely. What we're doing is intervening against the failure's possible success. Oh, holy cow. What am I saying? I'm tossing out the hierarchy of controls. I'm complaining about prevention. What is wrong with me? Well, um, the one thing that's wrong with me, I think, is that ultimately I'm relatively sure that prevention biases resilience. And I, that's a hard thing to say because your response to me is going to be, well, prevention and resilience are two parts of the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. They're the same word. It's a distinction without a difference. I heard that one the other day. I love that. Uh, yeah, that's all true. But ultimately, when we talk about this bias and we talk about essential controls, one of the things we have to bias away from is the fact that every event could have been prevented. It just couldn't be. And we have to let go of the fact that controls somehow, for some reason, follow this engineering hierarchy. It's just not true. Any control that stops a person from dying is a good control. Any control. Uh, the, the, a, a blade of grass, if it works, is great. And that's really a function of wanting the world to be very linear and predictable, wanting the world to be a place that we can understand and, and manage, but ultimately living in a world that has anomalies, that has black swan events, that has freaky deaky things that happen to our systems. It has ways for people to die that we did not imagine. And that's where the power of the essential control and the essential control checklist or questions or uh, starting when certain, those things really make a big difference. Because ultimately what we're saying is, is that we don't want you to start a job until the controls that will keep you alive are in place. And if you use those controls precursively, well, they're prevention tools. Absolutely. You're exactly right. But if you need them, they suddenly become more than just prevention tools they become barriers, they become safeguards, they become controls. And we can argue this a lot, uh, and we have. I mean, one of the ways we could look at this is the difference between static risk and fluid risk. We could look at it as the difference between risk management and risk control, or we can look at it in a bow tie. I mean, that's a great way to understand this. But really, what I think we have to look at is the sheer fact that fatalities happen not because the organization failed to prevent the fatality from happening, but because the fatality and the energy therein didn't have barriers against causing harm. Think about it. What you do for a living is you're constantly intervening against failure becoming successful. And so our challenge is, is to build a world that allows us to have a conversation that doesn't bias us towards prevention. Of course we can do this. And of course it's meaningful. It's just different. It's a disruption into the traditional way we think and have been thinking a long, long, long time. But the way we've been thinking is not sufficient to take us to the next level. So I was at a meeting yesterday, really powerful people, like the kind of meeting where everybody has their own plane. I'm not kidding. I mean, it was that kind of, a lot of CEOs. Um, it was funny. The person who did the meeting said, Todd, I hope you like this meeting. We're on the premier tier of uh, refreshments. And I said, what's the premier tier of refreshments? Is that gold-plated donuts? And the person said, no, it's just China instead of paper plates. A little disappointing, although the refreshments were amazing. But I was at this meeting, and what's amazing to me about this meeting is that our discussion, to a great extent in this meeting, was around the notion of preventing fatalities. 
and this really, really powerful guy, a president of a huge, huge, huge construction company, a gigantic one, he said something that I think is worth repeating to you. He said, we are a room predominantly filled with engineers. There is a technical solution to every problem, and we're very powerful people. We solve problems we want solved. And then he paused and he looked at his peers and he said, I don't know if our current thinking puts us in a position where we want to not kill people. And that's what has to change. Because if we want to not kill people, we will create a system of all the people on earth. It's us. We will create a system where people don't die. That's really important. And how we get there to a great extent, is what this podcast is about. This notion of essential controls, to a great extent, think about it. It's everything. And it's going to really change the way we look at work. And it's going to change the way we think because we're going to have to really identify risk differently than we've ever identified it before. We're going to have to think about things like resilience and recovery when we do risk assessments. But more importantly, what we're going to have to think about are the three questions. What will kill you when you do this job? When it happens, because we don't live in a perfect world with perfect systems, when it happens, what keeps us from dying? And then the last question, the question about sufficiency, is that enough? Today's podcast is just a little exercise and thought. I mean, uh, there was quite a bit of pressure to get this out, but I wanted to get it out at least in time for us to think about the fact that this essential controls problem, it's an interesting problem. It's, it's, it's one for the ages, and it's certainly one for your commute to work. Thanks for sharing your little part of the day with me. Thanks for letting me be in your ears. That's always kind of, it's comfortable in here and warm and a little damp and waxy. Um, but until then, we're going to be out there doing what we do every single day. Tell your friends about the podcast, subscribe, write me a review, but only a good one. That seems to matter. And most importantly, are you ready for this? Learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>